to divert your attention to the corner of the room right here where this big orange box is. Um, the Black Student Alliance is um, trying to save our Black Cultural Center. So we're asking that everyone fill out these pledge cards. Um, you can donate a minimum of $20 either to your U-Bill or we will take cash or check. And basically the Black Cultural Center has been out of commission for the past year. It's had some flooding and significant damage and we're trying to raise about $40,000 uh, by the end of April to renovate the Black Cultural Center. So if you guys could just please show your support um, at the end of the speaker, that would be great. Um, but tonight, uh, I'm here to introduce Alfredo Parrish, who will be culminating the Black History Month celebration. Alfredo Parrish was born in Selma, Alabama in 1947. He received a BA in History at the University of Dubuque in 1967 and a law degree from the University of Iowa in 1970, where he served as president of the Student Bar Association. His areas of practice include civil rights, criminal and employment law, litigation and appeals, personal injury, and white-collar crimes. However, 80% of his practice is devoted to litigation. He has represented numerous cases such as Wilson versus City of Des Moines, U.S. versus Thurman, State versus Hardy, and English versus Missledine. His professional associations and memberships include the University of Iowa Law School Foundation, Des Moines Arts Center, the Des Moines University Board of Directors, and Iowa Supreme Court Commission on Cameras in the Courtroom. He currently serves as legal counsel to Creative Visions and is a managing partner with Parrish, Crydonier, Moss, Dunn, Bowles, Gribble, and Cook. And without further ado, I will please join me in welcoming Mr. Alfredo Parrish. First of all, let me uh, thank you for the uh, invitation of coming to uh, Iowa State University. And uh, the last, uh, I was talking to uh, Ms. Miller and I was just telling her that uh, she said, well, she was a little bit surprised that I was able to show up. She kept thinking I was going to back out at the last minute because I have been trying quite a few cases uh, lately. But I have had some time to kind of work on this speech. As a matter of fact, the other day I was, what I normally do when I'm getting ready to give a speech, I sit at my desk at, while they're at home or at my office and I punch in Google. And I says, well, I'll have a great idea. I'll pull up race and justice. So I punch in race and justice in Iowa and my name pops up on the Iowa State website. I said, boy, this really helps me a lot to get started. So from there, I had to start looking somewhere else as to where I was going to start to talk about uh, what the situation looked like in Iowa. And so I was uh, reading uh, the Editorial Observer, which is the section right below the New York Times, and the editorial page, and there was this article, it was about Iowa, and it said, uh, the person who was writing it, and this is a summary of what the article said, Verlin Clinkenborough, Editorial Observer column says, eliminating Iowa state income tax for people under 30, which legislature is now considering will now be, not be enough to keep young people from leaving the state. It says the demographic problem is due to its wholehearted, uncritical embrace of industrial agriculture, which has depopulated countryside, destroyed economic and social texture of small towns, and made certain that ordinary Iowans are defenseless against pollution of factory farming. That was written on February 9th of uh, 2005. Then there were letters to the editor that was written about two days later from a person in Iowa City, whom I don't know, but she says, to the editor, which was published in the New York Times. And it says, it's headline like this, try to imagine the Iowa of my dreams. And it says, Iowa is soulful, to the editor. I'm a lifelong Iowan with a deep love and pride for my home state. I agree wholeheartedly with Verlin Clickenborough, keeping Iowa's young folks at home after they've seen Minnesota. Young people will stay in Iowa when there are jobs, towns, farms, and a way of life that make them want to stay. Without those, they will leave no matter what the tax rate. Your reader should know, however, that there are dedicated, visionary folks in every corner of the state who are working to create a sustainable, diverse, locally-based agricultural economy here, 
the sooner our public officials and institutions recognize how much these efforts benefit the whole state, the stronger we will be. And I say that, and this is her conclusory uh, paragraph, and this is my point. Iowa is a beautiful, soulful place to live, but it is in need of a wake-up call. Thank you for saying so bluntly what many do not want to hear. That's what I want to talk about tonight, and that is about Iowa. As much of the country right now is sorely in need of a wake-up call. W.B. Du Bois, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, wrote a speech in 1953, and in that speech, Du Bois was talking about how are we going to really take some measurement of where African Americans are in society. And in his speech, we often see charts. And many of us get irritated by the charts that show up in a lot of the publications. And in these publications, these charts, they talk about how do you compare the conditions of African Americans with other people. And they say, well, really, we can't really compare it uh, properly, at least Du Bois says, to that of whites. He called it a crude and unfair comparison. There's not much to be learned by comparing a group of less than that time he was writing in 1953 than a century removed from slavery and still suffering grave social and economic discrimination with a mass of white citizens. The best and most valuable comparison would be that of contrasting the group with itself at different times and places. Then he goes on to make a statement about where, in fact, uh, African Americans at this time, and this is in 1953. He says literacy is really on par with Europe. Health is relatively good. Expectation of life is good. Exceeds that of South America and West Indies. And economic conditions is better than that of citizens of India, China, and the Middle East, and any part of Africa. And I don't know whether many of you had the opportunity to see C-SPAN uh, this weekend, but they had a program on about the state of the union of uh, African Americans, or blacks as they called it. And in that, they had speakers from all over the United States, a lot of the leaders of the minority community speaking. And that was really one of the consensus that came out of the program. I was so fascinated about it, about it that I ended up spending about six hours watching this C-SPAN program on Saturday. And it's going to be replayed. And one of the themes of that program is that we are basically ahead of a lot of the other uh, African uh, around the world. And what they were saying in terms of that concept is that if we're waiting for new laws, if we're waiting for new programs, if we're waiting for new incentives from the government, it's just not going to happen. What the program seems to be saying, it's about time that many of us start looking to ourselves, start looking to the programs that are in existence, start addressing some of the problems that are deep within our society, and when I mean our society, that don't look to the white society to give us some of the answers to some of the problems, but what we really are going to have to start doing is looking within ourselves. I say that as an introduction to talk a little bit about myself and give you an idea of some of my philosophy, and in the end I'm going to talk about some of the statistics that exist in this state that are somewhat frightening and that exist across the country that are frightening, and I'm going to try to offer what I think might be some solutions, at least as I see it, uh, to the problems. I've had the opportunity of practicing law in this state for nearly 30 years. I've tried cases, and what I mean by cases, major cases, in 66 of Iowa, 99 counties. I was educated uh, in Iowa, basically, uh, University of Buke and University of Iowa, as you've just been told. And I've had two of my kids, both a daughter who now practices law in Nashville, Tennessee, educated at the University of Iowa after going out east to undergraduate school, and my son, who I now have the opportunity of practicing law with, uh, who also went to Brown and into the University of Iowa and now practices law uh, in this state. It has allowed me the opportunity of building a business and what I would consider, other people may disagree, of becoming a productive citizen uh, in this state. It has provided numerous opportunities for me. But in addition to that, I have had run-ins, and I'll give you a couple examples I'd like to share with you. In Fort Dodge, a few years ago, I was being introduced. It was a jury trial. My client was white. Uh, the judge sitting on the bench in the courtroom was packed with about 200 people in there. 
because we were in the process of selecting the jury. And one of the examples, and I tell people, I've gotten to the point where having practiced law for so long, I basically transcended race to a certain extent. And what I mean by that, when I walk in to start picking a jury, people don't concentrate on the fact that I'm black or white, yellow or green, but the fact that I practice law and I try a lot of jury trials. I'll give you an example. I'm picking a jury in Fort Dodge, Iowa. My client's white. Everyone else in the courtroom is white. The judge on the bench says uh, he's introducing the jury, uh, the prospective jurors, to the lawyers in the courtroom. The judge says the gentleman over there in the blue suit is uh, Mr. Jones, for one of his other words. The gentleman in the green suit is Mr. Smith. The gentleman in the, uh, let's say, purple suit is Mr. Sutton. And the black guy over there is Alfredo Perich, who represents the defendant. That's the type of situation that you'll normally run into in this state, a state of very subtle form. And when I brought it to the judge's attention in the, uh, during the recess, uh, he was a little taken aback, saying, well, I really didn't mean anything about it. Well, why couldn't I have on a suit just like all the other lawyers? What, why did the color of my skin become somewhat important? I don't know uh, how many of you had the opportunity to read the newspaper today, but they profiled a doctor. The Des Moines Register has been profiling, and the doctor's name was Dr. Riley. And I'll tell you another little incident of what you normally run into in this state in the form of persons who might have reached some degree of prominence that you never forget, really, that you are a minority in this state. Dr. Riley and talk, they talked about, I believe, two of his daughters who are now doctors and two of his son-in-laws are doctors. Several years ago, I had a case. And in this case, this client came to see me. This client was arrested and had been taken to the uh, city jail in Des Moines, Iowa. And as he was arrested and he was, uh, uh, he was injured, and they arrested him for intoxication. So they take him to the jail, and he stays there for six hours. Unfortunately, he has an injury, and he's, during, he's, going, he's bleeding internally. So they won't take him to the hospital until like 7 o'clock the next morning. The long and short of this story they rush, he's a white fellow, so they rush him over to the hospital finally about 7 o'clock the next morning. He's been rushed into the emergency room. Dr. Riley is going to be his surgeon. He completes the operation. So the client comes to see me later and wants to sue the city police for not taking him directly to jail. And someone has referred him to me. So I'm in the process of interviewing him, and he says, oh, by the way, I have an interesting story to tell you. He said, when I was first injured and I was rushed over to the hospital, and this happens to be Mercy Hospital, and I am going to call a few names tonight, and uh, he says that as he's wheeled into the emergency room, the nurse turns to him and says, uh, you're going to have to have surgery, and um, the doctor who's going to perform the surgery is a black doctor. The guy says, I don't care what color he is, just give me the operation. The long and short of that story is, and I'll tell you the ending of the story, is that now at this Mercy Hospital where this well-respected doctor who's profiled now by the register, the nurse proceeds to tell this white patient, who she perhaps will think will never hear the story again, that he's about to be given surgery by a black doctor in an emergency situation. The long and short of the story, we sue the city of Des Moines. We ended up collecting, I think, maybe $70,000. This was probably 10 years ago or something like that. Because we asked for, for every hour that this young man uh, was not taken to the hospital, he should be given $10,000. And the jury ended up uh, agreeing with that and giving him that as a verdict. I share those anecdotes with you to give you some idea that even in Iowa, a state we all love, it still has a tendency to not quite reach the point where we want it to be, where you often are reminded, no matter what stature you reach in life, of who you are and what your status is. It doesn't mean that everyone thinks like that, but it does mean to some extent that our state is structured in that fashion, and many of us are reminded in many times. But that really sets the stage for what race and justice might be in this state. Our job is to engage people, yourselves and other people, because I don't think without a doubt tonight I'm speaking with people who are uh, the choir. I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak. I don't think I have to convert any of you. But what you're going to have to do is decide amongst yourselves that you're going to have to re-engage the people in this state in a dialogue, because that dialogue is now missing. Iowa has a long history of being fair. It was the place that was set aside 
for people who decided to take the journey on the Underground Railroad. It was on the side of the Union in the Civil War. It was one of the first states in the country to desegregate the schools. It was one of the first states in the country to desegregate the lunch counters. And also, it was one of the first places to west of the Mississippi for a woman to graduate from law school. It's never been a terrible hotbed of right wing or for racism. There is no particular crisis in this state at the moment, but there is a crisis of us failing to engage in serious discussions about the state of race relations in this state. Let me now share with you some statistics. Iowa State University, minority students graduated the rate of 43%. When is the last time that was brought up to the president or other people? Iowa City, where I graduated from, 34% the graduation rate of minorities. The prison population, if you're talking about Anamosa, Clarinda, Fort Dodge, and the other institutions here where they incarcerate people, 26% of the people who are incarcerated are black, African American, of a population that's less than 3%. 17% of all the juveniles held in Iowa are minorities. Recently, the state of Iowa found that state troopers were stopping uh, blacks at a rate that was discriminatory and decided that they were going to start an internal investigation of their own to make sure that if you're stopping uh, blacks when they are driving, that the, you make a note of it so that process will stop. However, we do know that racial profiling and driving while black is something that is, is running rampant in this state, in the cities, in the suburbs. We also know that the street officer, the police officer, is the first line of interdiction in the state in any type of the process of an arrest. But we also must know and understand that that is only the first step. The next step is the decision to prosecute that individual. That means that even though the police officers, and we know that very few minority officers exist in any of the jurisdictions, whether it's the DCI, FBI, the local uh, police uh, officers uh, in this state, whether or not it's the uh, state troopers, the sheriff's officers, we know that they don't have very many minorities working in those departments. And we know we, they even have fewer working in the decision-making process. So, you know, one thing we used to do when we asked about, you go back 50 years, where last year we were, uh, last year we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Education. The biggest thing about that decision is that it added diversity. And I remember years ago in 1967 when I started at the University of Iowa Law School, and there were only three, I think, uh, minority students at that time uh, in the law school, what we wanted to do is, at least the theme was to create diversity, to have the interchange of ideas. So my experience could be shared with someone else's experience. And without that in management and law enforcement, we run into an extremely difficult problem of how do you interdict in a way that's fair. But the decision to prosecute, and let me tell you who these people are. The people who make the decision to prosecute are people who've gone to law school. These people have gone to three years of college, or three years of graduate school above undergraduate school. This means that these are some of the most highly educated people in our state. But yet, the decisions that they make end up putting 26% of black people in prison. So what's wrong with the process that they're engaged in? Well, let's look for a second. We have the Attorney General of the state of Iowa, who perhaps makes many decisions that affect incarceration, lobbying decisions, etc. And you ask the question, how many minorities does he have in his office? And he's considered a pretty bona fide, liberal, open-minded person. He has 80 to 100 lawyers employed. It may shock you that he perhaps has two minority lawyers in his office. That's surprising, but yet we tolerate it. We don't talk about it. Because to talk about it 
is not good. It may not be politically correct. But it's time that we re-engage in the process of talking about why in our most highly educated offices in this state do we allow that to happen? Well, we know policy decisions are making, decisions to incarcerate people, people uh, decisions are being made to see how long drug sentences go, decisions are made to whether to sue or not sue someone. And we look in that office and we have an elected official in this state and we tolerate it and we don't talk about it and we don't discuss it. It's about time we start discussing matters like that. We also can look at the local county attorney's offices. We can look down at Johnson County Attorney's Office. We can look at right over here in Story County Attorney's Office and the decision to prosecute in those offices. And you ask them, how many minorities do they have? And it doesn't mean you have to have a minority to make the correct decision, but you must have the interchange. You must have the diversity. You must have the exchange of ideas. You must have it where someone can tell you maybe your decision is not correct. But we don't have it in this state. We don't have it in Story County. In your own offices where the Office of General Counsel sits, how much diversity is there in terms of the exchange to make a decision whether or not to kick a kid out of school, or whether or not to uh, deny a scholarship or a policy-making factor that may affect their economic status? What do you have in your own office here at campus? Have you asked yourselves that type of uh, question? If it's not, if you don't know, you need to find out. Once you find out, you need to start asking the questions. In our own offices in Polk County, attorney's office where 30 to 40 lawyers, the question we have to ask, who helps makes the decision in those offices to prosecute? We do know, though, and I again share with you a rich heritage that Iowa has. A lawyer, matter of fact, who used to be a WHO news reporter, was one of the first black United States attorneys appointed. Uh, it was Don Dickerson, who's now a Polk County District Court judge. Don worked for me as a law clerk. He then uh, worked for me as a lawyer. Roxanne Conlon, who has a long tradition of trying to make things better uh, for all people, women and minorities in this state, hired Don Nickerson as the first, uh, as an assistant United States attorney, one of the first in the state, and he eventually became the United States attorney, which had the power to prosecute all cases in this below Highway 30 in the state of Iowa. And did his policy change? And did he have a more compassionate approach? Yes, he did. When the opportunity came for him to institute the first death penalty case in Iowa several years ago, before the first one was tried last year, he refused to impose the death penalty uh, in that case or seek to uh, have a person uh, executed uh, in the state. Again, diversity makes a difference. And people who, in fact, have ideas that are different ought to be heard from within the offices where the people have the power to make life and death decisions, freedom a decision or incarceration decisions on individuals. When there's a decision to prosecute someone who has in fact a crack cocaine conviction, whether or not you, uh, not a crack cocaine conviction, but a crack cocaine charge, how much penalty are you gonna ask for? That's a decision that again requires some reflection. What if a police officer is shot? Does it go to the grand jury or do you make a decision to prosecute? What if the person is a minority who the police officer shot? Who makes that decision? A grand jury comes in and make it or the prosecutor uh, makes it on their own? What about if you want to work out a plea bargain with someone? Who are the people who, makes that, who make, will make that decision with our, in, within our judicial system? Who makes the decision whether or not the person is going to get probation or go to prison? In a recent study of all the burglary charges in the United States, 50% of all whites charged with burglary had charges reduced. Only 33% of all black people charged with the exact same crime. Of all the people who got sentences enhanced, 19% of blacks got their sentence enhanced, and what I mean by that, got their sentence increased. Only 15% of whites got any of their sentences increased.
Then there's the situation of bail prior to trial. And that's the situation where you go into court, you, the charges have been filed against you, and then you have to make the decision, or the people in authority will have to make a decision, are you going to be released pending trial? In bail situations, blacks are rarely released. And I don't want to bore you with the statistics about the death penalty because we all know that, what happens there. Let me give you another example across the country. For drug crimes, whites serve an average of 27 months. Blacks, 46 months. Blacks are 59% of all citizens convicted of drug crimes, yet they only make up 11% of the population. And let me just summarize these facts for you before I get into a little bit of discussion about what are we going to do about this, those of us who believe we are part of the choir and are convinced. In 1995, one in three black males between the age of 20 and 29 were either in prison, in jail, probation, or on parole. One in 14 black males were in prison or jail. If they were born in 1991 or after, one in three have a chance of being in prison before they die. There are more black men under criminal supervision than in college. For every black male that graduates from college, 100 are arrested. Let's listen to that again for all of you lucky ones who are in college. For every black male that graduates from college, 100 are arrested. Once you're arrested, you lose your civil rights and you can't vote. So what are we going to do about it? Well, let's look at what the factors are that will, in fact, uh, have some impact on us. We have to do something to improve prosecut prosecutors' accountability. That means like the attorney generals, the county attorneys, the legislators, le legislators need to understand that increasing sentences without looking at the source of the problem is not the solution. We need to seriously consider making an effort to repeal mandatory sentencing laws. Public defenders are where there are very few minorities employed need to make a greater effort to get more minorities in their offices to defend my other minorities. We need to start making an effort that every time there's a juvenile case, it does not automatically need to be transferred to adult court. And those of you may have followed the situation where two 14-year-olds at Hoover High School were charged with an assault, and they now I said 14, they may be 16, they want to transfer it. It happened at a school event, want now to transfer these kids to adult court. People who are charged with a crime should, in fact, once they serve their sentence, should have a right to vote and get a restoration of their civil rights. And let me share with you a matter that has been in the news lately and just give you my take on it. Obviously, we know Iowa goes out like any other school and recruits minority athletes. And that's no different than any other state because they want to win. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did you guys lose to who the other night? That was Nebraska? Couldn't believe that. Jeez. That was yesterday, right? Not the other night. Um, but anyway, what we need to do is that there is a responsibility that goes with this recruitment to let these young athletes know that Iowa is a conservative state, that Iowa is a state where prosecutors seek oftentimes the maximum punishment. The schools have a responsibility 
to bring these kids in, not with a standard seminar program, but bring in people from the community, maybe people who have been convicted of crimes, and sit down and talk to them about the punishment that people will try to mete out in this state. They need to understand that there is a lack of diversity within prosecutor's office. And there is a huge lack of understanding by prosecutors of the problems that minority people have in adjusting to this state. I was once a 16-year-old person who was destined to play basketball when I came to this state after applying for two years in junior college. And I tell people all the time, now I look at this state from a different perspective, but in 1965, when I arrived here, this state looked huge. The problems looked insurmountable. I had no money and, and no family here, no connections here, and I was living in Dubuque, Iowa. I can see it like it was yesterday. I can imagine some kid coming here from Chicago, coming here from New York, coming here from Los Angeles, and trying to take a view of this state. And then not having, clearly, they have no money. They have few resources. They're trying to get an education. They're trying to spend all the hours trying to compete athletically. But yet the university says we're doing our job. They say it here at Iowa State University. They say it at the University of Northern Iowa. And they say it at the University of Iowa. And I'm telling you, except for a few, they are not doing their job with the black athlete that they bring here. And you know what happens? They are transferred from the sports page to the front page. And you know what? We need to speak up about it. You need to remind the administration. You need also to remind these athletes how difficult the job is. But also the coaches have a responsibility to make sure if they bring these kids in here that these kids not only graduate but stay out of trouble when they're going through the process of trying to graduate. Nowadays, we all want to be absolutely politically correct. We don't want to offend each other. We don't want to offend our friend. And we don't want to offend our teacher. We don't want to offend our neighbor. We don't want to offend other students. But you know, we all have a responsibility to be a little provocative. As Larry Summers, for those of you who follow that, uh, says we have a little responsibility to be a bit more provocative. Now, I've thrown out those statistics, but I want to share something else with you. You know, we as black people have a responsibility also to ourselves. And in listening to this program the other night, I had a few quotes that came out. And I want to share some of those with you. Uh, Joyce Elders said this comment. She says, we have kids graduated from high school whose shoes light up when they walk and whose brains go dead when they talk. <laughs> and you know, she's making a very good point here because we are not meeting our responsibility when we see these kids uh, get themselves in situation. And Bill Cosby, to some extent, whether you agree with him or not, is making an attempt to address this issue. There was one quote from, and I forget his name, you all can remind me, uh, who's the guy from Chicago after, uh, not, uh, come on, the Muslim leader? Farrakhan. He says, we have become the enemy of ourselves. Crack cocaine, drive-by shooting, school dropout, teenage pregnancies. So we're becoming one of our biggest enemies. And we're not demanding anything. And he quoted uh, Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglass. He says, power concedes nothing without a demand and people who do not make the effort of increasing their power and taking care of their own problems can never request that power concede anything to them. One of the speakers also said, if children do not see the future, they will not pay the price. Those are just a few of the quotes that came out of the conference that was held uh, this weekend. But it is a dual responsibility. It's my responsibility. It's the responsibility of you who sit in this audience who believe they want to be future lawyers, future educators, 
for the whites of you who sit in this audience and the blacks who sit in this audience to start the discussion again about the state of race relations in this state. You sit in a lap of luxury and maybe you don't see it now. I will guarantee you that you will see it 15 years from now that you are sitting in the lap of luxury to exchange ideas, to set the correct forces on a course to make you make a difference in this world. I recall when I graduated from law school in 1970, I decided to myself, and I decided even before that I was going to change the world. And I tell people now, I found out I couldn't change the world but I can change it one case at a time. And I'm pretty satisfied with that process, that I can change the world one case at a time. With opportunities like this to share with you the story of a person who is no different than any of you, whose mom and dad were teachers at one point, and they were both fired when George Wallace, which many of you can't know, became a governor of the state, and so for seven years, my folks did not have a job while I was in school, which was some of the most difficult times that you could ever experience. But through that process, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about other people in this state. And I truly believe that Iowa presents a very, very unique opportunity. And I truly believe that Iowa is a beautiful, soulful place to live, but it just needs a wake-up call. And I think all of us should be part of that wake-up call. Because if we don't get the wake-up call, things won't change. And those statistics that I talked to you about will be around next year and the year after. And it just doesn't have to be that way. We have too much opportunity to make this a much better place and improve the lives for ourselves and for our children and for our friends and for our family. I'm going to stop here and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take any questions about this topic, race and justice or law school for those who are interested in it. So feel free to ask any questions you like. Go ahead. I have a question. Has there been any sort of lobbying or any sort of legislation proposed for um, ex convicts to get their voting rights? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, there's a lawsuit in Florida on this subject, and I don't know the status of it. It's filed in federal court. There has been some discussion, I believe, uh, one of the legislators uh, from Iowa uh, has either introduced or is contemplating introducing a bill in Iowa. Uh, what can happen is that you can get a restoration of some of your civil rights after five years uh, in Iowa. You make an application uh, to the governor's office. And the governor office then issues you what they call a restoration of civil rights, which takes a number of years. Many people don't do it. Uh, people think the process is cumbersome. It's not ver a very difficult process, but it does take some time. You have to get special uh, permission from the, the governor's office to get that done. But I think it should be automatic because to deprive uh, felons of the right to vote, particularly after they've served their uh, sentence and without a pardon. Now, pardon is a much more cumbersome process. And you have to demonstrate, you know, some uh, semblance that you are conducting a, uh, a law-abiding life, you have employment, you have family members, friends, and everyone who comes in and then vouches for you. Then you get a pardon. Then that's completely taken off your record. But that's a much more difficult process to go through. And pardons are not given uh, very uh, freely uh, in this state or in any other state. But the key is that, you know, if you go in and you get a three-year sentence, after your three-year sentence, the minute you walk out, the minute that sentence ends, you have a right to vote, 
which is one of our most cherished rights uh, that we have in this country, is where we ought to go with this process. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And second, I have a, um, a comment about, uh, I think first it starts with, um, it's our community, it's our, the things that we do as far as the, you said the basketball players in Iowa, I think stuff we do is really stupid as far as like putting people out and things like that. I think that's where it's about those names of focus on, you know, uh, the legislation and whatnot. I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, kids are going to be kids no matter who they are, uh, and kids are going to make mistakes no matter who they are. And the question is, I think the responsibility is, obviously it belongs to the parent, the friends uh, who are with the, uh, the kids. But, you know, I often remind people, uh, you know, at one point I was, uh, maybe all you guys are much better off than I was when I was a kid in terms of doing things that you call a mistake now. But, you know, obviously when I was growing up, I tell people I made a lot of what I call mistakes. Uh, if I had to uh, uh, pay a price for all of those mistakes, that I made, um, I wouldn't be standing here right now. The question is, is when those mistakes are made, if you can put them in proper balance. But you are right. We have to uh, teach ourselves to do things that are correct, teach ourselves not to harm people, teach ourselves to respect other people. And uh, that's part of, of what our job is. And when we see kids and we see our friends doing things that we know they have no business doing, that will subject them to harm, but also someone else's harm, our responsibility, whether you're a student, a friend, a buddy, or just a passerby, is to tell that person you need to look out. But also the university, when they bring kids who are not used to the same environment that we share here in this state, they have a responsibility when these kids come in to talk to them to make sure they clearly understand. You know, you can't have any what I call nebulous areas or vague areas. If this happens, I can assure you this is going to happen. But a lot of these kids who come in here don't really understand or have a great appreciation of that. Um, yeah. I know you can't comment on something that's ongoing, but last <laughs> summer we had one of our former athletes go to jail for, I think, 300 days for stealing a cell phone. I mean, what he did was wrong, but it, it, do you know of any white people who have gone to jail for 300 days for stealing a cell phone? Uh, was this an athlete? Yes. Okay, well, I tell you, two problems crop up, and, and, and I tell you, two type of uh, facts, uh, fact, facts come into play. First of all, when an athlete commits a crime, uh, it doesn't matter whether that athlete is black, white, yellow, or green. You, you, if that athlete runs against an elected official, the, the thought process, and I'm not speaking for these people, says, well, if an athlete does something, that's news. I have to be awful careful as how I'm going to handle this problem. So the athlete becomes a focus of a problem that if you were a nobody, it would never crop up. I can give you numerous examples of clients who I've represented over the years uh, whose crime never gets in the newspaper, the incident never gets reported, the incident never goes uh, anywhere. It's taken care of. Now. The athlete does it and you get wind of it, or the press gets wind of it, look out. A whole different process comes into being. Because the public is going to say, well, Mr. Politician, if you let that athlete off, you're in big trouble because you're not going to get uh, reelected. Second of all, if my kids get, get, kid gets in trouble and you let the athlete off, then why are you treating the athlete different? So that comes into play. So you have all kind of pressure that comes into play. But let's make, let's color this athlete. Let's make this athlete black. Ooh, has anyone read, everyone read this book, Blink? If you've not read this book, you must read it. You absolutely must read this book. And let me tell you why, because it goes to my next question. Blink is a book that just came out. It was written by a guy. Uh, it was a biracial guy, but his second book is, I can't, his first book he wrote was The Tipping Point. The second book he's just written is Blink, and I have not read The Tipping Point, but I bought it the other day. And Blink talks about how we in this society, now, if you throw race into it, and there's this test you can take at Harvard, you can take it on the web. I haven't taken it yet because I failed the one in the book. But anyway, this book goes through it. It's just an amazing analysis. If, in fact, you take this test about race, he found out that he favored white 
more than he favored black. And he says, something's wrong with me because I'm, I'm um, biracial. But then they took the test. You can take it on the Harvard website. I think maybe 5,000. I could be, don't hold me to this. 5,000 African Americans took it. And 80% of them favored white over black. Now, I make that point to say when you throw race and athlete into it, it becomes an even more explosive type of subject. So you have the judges coming into play. You have the prosecutor in perhaps an all-white office coming into play. You have no diversity, no one explaining to them that the decision they are making is perhaps incorrect because they are not taking all the other factors into consideration. So you're right. You may end up with an aberration in the sentence or an aberration in the charge. Or, on top of that, you may get an aberration in representation. When I was talking to my law partner tonight about the speech, and she said, well, it's Maggie Moss, who was a prosecutor for a number of years. She said to me, she's so upset by what's happening. Everything she said is going backwards. I said, I can't say that, Maggie. I said, she says, I think that she sees more race-based decisions than she's ever seen uh, nowadays. And the problem is that we're not discussing it anymore. When we see something like that happening, maybe I don't see anything. Or maybe I'm, I don't see anything because people say, well, he's playing the race card. Even though it's not my case, but if I see it, I'll write a note to the prosecutor. I'll sit down and have someone else call him. I'll call someone else. So call this guy and says, you're being nutty. But if you see things like that going on, you have to speak up. Otherwise, it will keep happening, particularly in this state, because you don't have like a governor or a barometer, like maybe you have in Chicago, uh, in, uh, Illinois, or have in New York, or have in Alabama, where you won't have those aberrations. Iowa is a unique state, and it does allow for aberrations in a process because there's no real protective mechanism, because you don't have a strong statewide structure of minorities who will speak up and slap you on the head if you, if you don't get this right. And that's problematic. You know, we do have intellectuals in the state, a lot of bright people here, but we're so diverse within the process itself that we really don't respond to situations like that very well. And that's one of the problems that we have with this uh, judicial process and race and justice uh, in Iowa. Thanks, I, I really agree with what you're saying, but I, I still feel like, I, I'm Chicago, and I'm not going to environment around here. Um, so you said I need somebody to tell me how to act. Um, and I'm you know, not going to be trying to do things like that. I mean, I would basically be well, maybe you don't, but some people do. Some people do need to understand that. Do you know that uh, in this state, if you sold uh, drugs to someone who's 17, you could go to prison for 100 years? Well, of course. But did you know that? Yeah. It's one of the most, do you realize that if someone kills someone in this state, you go to prison for longer than any other state in the United States? The chances are, if someone commits a crime in New York, the same type of crime, they may be in prison for 10 to 25 years. In Iowa, it's life. They have the longest sentence, which I think is 36.8 years. One of the longest sentences, because they don't have a death penalty, that's one explanation of it, but they have the longest life sentence of any state in the United States. And I could go on with crime after crime after crime that perhaps people don't real, really put into focus when they walk into this state. But Iowa is considered a conservative state. It's not bad. I, I consider it what I call an enlightened conservative state. But it's a very conservative state when it comes to law and when it comes to enforcement of the law. But also within that context, you don't have diversity within the decision-making process of people who will be making the call. If, say, for instance, you got in trouble in Chicago for, like, a traffic ticket, well, it may not be a big deal. But if you got a problem here with a traffic ticket and you got your car searched and you got mad at the police officer for searching your car because you were black, your reaction is going to be a little bit different. And you've been taken in front of a place and someone said, can you make them see what it's like? When I'm picking a jury and I'm representing a young black kid, I'll say, can you imagine what it's like to sit in a place, and I'm asking the white jury this, where everybody else 
around you as black? That's very hard to do. That's very hard to do, to make them see the picture the way your client might be seeing it. And that's a difficult process. And you know, being from Chicago, and you say, yeah, no one has to tell you to do right from wrong, but you know, have, to, have a, a couple of beers too many one night, and everything changes. It's not like having a couple of beers too much uh, in Chicago. In this state, my son was representing a young man and, uh, who had a, a few too many beers. Driving home, a fellow was killed. You know the penalty in Iowa? 25 years. No probation, no parole, no chance at probation. This doesn't mean that the law is bad. It means that we need to be knowledgeable of the fact of the environment in which we're living. And oftentimes we see, we set a perspective, these young kids set a perspective of say Chicago, New York, California, Birmingham or whatever, where they see encounters and things don't happen that are bad. But yet when you come here and things that happen and you're standing, you're stand out, you're an athlete, it's a whole different world. So that's the point I'm making with regard to that. Doesn't mean that you, know, you give the okay on people uh, to do bad things. I often tell people, particularly when I'm speaking to lawyers and prosecutors, I'll say, well, I was speaking to a, boot, a group of editors from around the state about two months ago uh, up at the Supreme Court. And uh, I said, you know, one thing people forget, people talk about having real, really severe penalties in this state for crimes. I said, you realize that's how I make a lot of money. The more severe you make the punishment, the more money I make. Because more kids who have money get in trouble so they hire me to defend them. But my job is to make sure people don't get terrible, unfair sentences. So why should we have punished people to the extent that we do? I'm arguing against what I truly believe about what society ought to offer. They ought to offer society, society ought to offer compassionate punishment. It's not the fact that you shouldn't punish people, but punishment should be compassionate. I make more money when they have harsh are penalties because people want to hire people who know how to win cases. So I get lucky then. But it doesn't mean that because I make money in that way that that's the right way for society to run. Society must be compassionate. Other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, they adjusted that. Uh, and I tell you, two things have happened. I don't want to cut your question off, but go ahead. Oh, uh -huh. well, I was just going to say, is there some sort of rational legal justification for that, or is that just plain discriminatory on the face? Well, I had that in my uh, outline that I was going to speak about. And she raises a good question. If you have crack cocaine, which they argue is a choice of uh, African American people who use you know, severe drugs, or serious drugs, uh, as opposed to powder cocaine, that was the law. Uh, up until I think maybe a month and a half, well, no, it was longer than a month and a half ago. What Congress did is increase the penalty. They thought they would decrease the penalty for five grams of crack. They increased the penalty for powered cocaine. Now, about a month ago, you may have heard the United States Supreme Court in a case called Booker, and for whatever it's worth, the name of it is irrelevant. What they did, they made it they abolished the guidelines, okay? The guidelines were the uh, mechanism they used for sentencing people. Well, the United States Supreme Court said that the guidelines were unconstitutional, so federal judges now can pretty much sentence you where they would like to sentence you using the guidelines merely as advisory opinions, and that's what a lot of federal judges are beginning to do. The effect, and to answer your question specifically, that that has on powder and crack cocaine it does give federal judges some authority to equalize uh, uh, that sentence. And uh, so it's not quite as severe as it used to be because there is some discretion uh, with the judges now. The statutes are pretty much the same, but the guidelines that really activated the statutes are a little bit different. Let me, let me uh, go back to this young man's question. Let me give you another example of Iowa. And I can talk about this case. It's public record. I was in court today in Knoxville, Iowa. And I was representing a uh, white farmer who has 2,500 acres that he farms. 
was convicted four years ago for methamphetamine. His sentence was 25 years. Now, I'm not saying the crime is right or wrong. But the punishment, never been in trouble in his life. Trust me, in his life. 25 years before he's allowed, if he doesn't get this case reversed that we were arguing today, he will serve nearly eight years in prison for that crime where he was basically a methamphetamine user. They charged him with manufacturing, but that's the crime. So to talk about severity of sentences, you think he knew that? You think he was aware of that? And he lives in Iowa. He grew up here. He's a businessman in this community. The point is that if you have business people in this community who are not fully aware, and most of them are not, if you have young black kids coming in from the inner city that you recruit because they're outstanding athletes, not necessarily because they're highly skilled intellectuals, you're going to have some real problems. And the problem is it's the job of the university and our job to make sure that these kids understand the situation that it's being created. And it's not by accident that these kids end up on the front page. I mean, you look all across the United States from New York to California. So Iowa is not unique in that sense. Iowa is unique in its ability to resolve it in a manner where everything is, is uh, ruined. Yes, sir. What do you mean by compassionate punishment? What systems or improvements would you suggest or okay. implement? First of all, get rid of mandatory minimum sentences. I think they're awful. I think when someone has to go to prison automatically without a judge, you know, we educate these judges to learn how to sentence people based upon their background, their experiences, what has happened to them. For, this, for instance, this young man today I was representing, well, he's not really a young man. He's, you know, compared to you all, you probably say, well, he's in his 40s. He's almost 50. So to me, he's a young man. But anyway, so uh, this person, uh, the judge had no choice. So here's a farmer in front of a judge who must be given 25 years. He can't be given probation. He can't be given a 90-day shock sentence. He must go to prison for 25 years. And he must serve, at a minimum, eight years of that sentence, subject to certain reductions. But that's what he must serve. Mandatory minimum sentences really serve no purpose in our society if we have a judge who, where, where he or she will review the family situation, Decide by listening to a psychiatrist uh, what will happen. Let me give you another example. I was just finished defending a young 19-year-old kid down in Burlington, Iowa, who was charged with first-degree murder. It's a horrible crime, and so I'm not saying anything out of school. If that kid is convicted of second-degree murder, the judge must sentence him, must, to 50 years in prison, 50 years. There can be no probation, no parole. He must serve, before he's eligible to be released, 70% of that sentence. He must serve it. There's no ifs, no ands, no buts. So getting rid of, rid of mandatory minimum sentences, and there are national groups being formed to do that, to say give judges some input into that decision. The compassionate part for me would be and, and again, if I wanted to go, say, to drug crimes, New York, Arizona, two states that have more drugs than anybody, any place just about in the country, they have instituted because punishing people for drug crimes without any options of treatment is absolutely insanity. That's insanity. In New York, which is tough on drug crimes, will allow, if you would go to a treatment program and can successfully complete it, would allow you maybe to get rid of the crime that's associated with you. But if you fail, you go in and complete it. Iowa has no such program. They have a drug court in place where they now say, you know, judges who are experts now in drug uh, crimes can review it and see it. But you still got the mandatory sentence that kicked the judge's uh, intellect out of the picture. So the judge doesn't have a chance to, to put her input into the process. So that's what I mean by being more compassionate. At one point, our society started running away with mandatory minimum sentences. You know, no politician ever got elected to office by being uh, lessening the sentences, right? So what's the opposite? 
yep, I'm going to go in, I'm going to increase the sentence, and sure enough, I'm going to get elected. So they do that, and the process repeats itself. And now we've gotten ourselves on this way out on this end, and we can't get back, and we don't know how to get back. But Arizona is introducing some pretty interesting legislation. New York is doing something interesting. I'd like to see Iowa do something like that to make it a little bit more progressive. Iowa has been historically a fairly progressive state, but somehow it got locked in. You know, this meth problem is horrendous. I mean, it's horrible. The question is, how do we resolve it? I mean, um, I, I don't know, but we don't resolve it by putting people away for 75, 80 years. These are bright kids, but, you know, they're too stupid to, uh, to, to, to know the difference between meth and something else. But it doesn't mean you go lock them up, because most of these people are nothing but, but drug abusers. So that's the problem we have, and that's what I mean by compassionate punishment. Anyone else? I can take tough questions now. <laughs> if you don't agree with me, I can take some of that time. Yeah. You know, I, I haven't heard much in the legislator talking about more funds for drug treatment. Why is that? Well, I think that <clears throat> right now the big debate is the precursors, uh, you know, getting rid of these uh, pseudoephedrine drugs uh, that uh, are basically legal, but they use to what they call this Nazi process of making uh, methamphetamine. So that's the big push, and I think Oklahoma did as an experiment, and it helped out. So Iowa is looking at it, and that's been the big push this year because they feel if they could get rid of that, they could find out who the manufacturers are. Uh, because there's no doubt, meth is, uh, you know, people were talking about, and you all may have heard this in your other classes, talk about methamphetamine, the pleasure level that you get, and I've represented tons of people who have been charged with the crime, and and they say the pleasure, and this is one of the greatest pleasures that human beings know, is, a, is I think it's a mother breastfeeding a child. And with methamphetamine, it's a similar sensation. So once you get that sensation, and you want it again and again and again, and actually it's just killing you in the process. But they say it's the highest level of pleasure. Don't go out and try this because I make this statement. <laughs> but it's the highest level of pleasure you can get. So consequently, people, it's, it's just like the biggest ep epidemic. But the problem is that, Treatment helps also. You know, there's some great uh, treatment facilities and great doctors uh, who can help people with this problem. The question is, how do you mix uh, the two? And I think that's where our legislators are kind of at a loss. They can't quite figure it out. They don't need any more, uh, like I said about civil rights laws. Right now, we don't need any more civil rights laws. We need the black folks kind of get their act together and start working a little bit. We need white folks to get their act together. We need to have some dialogue. That's what we need right now in this process of civil rights. The same thing, I believe, with uh, the criminal justice system. We don't need to punish people anymore. We have enough laws to put all of us in jail a few times over, you know, and all of us be coming back in pine boxes. But we need to kind of mediate this process and see can we bring treatment up to the level where we have punishment. So that's where we need to address this problem right now. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, what do you think we should do about people who accept death people in jail or African Americans in jail? Well, I tell you, Bill, uh, did anyone hear Bill Gates' speech this weekend to the uh, National Governors Association? I had that and I was going to talk about it. It's interesting. This is Bill Gates, the guy who owns Microsoft. And he says, and that's, that's an excellent point you bring up. He says, is Bill Gates speaking this weekend? Gates and other speakers enumerated a list of alarming statistics to back up their argument that high schools are failing students, particularly low-income or minority children. The United States ranks 16th among 20 developed nations in the percentages of students who complete, complete high school and 14th among the top 20 in college graduation rates. Just 18 of 100 students Entering high school go to complete their college degree within six years of starting college. And the nation has slipped from fifth, first to fifth international in the percentage of young people who hold college degrees. This is what he says. And he's talking about the challenge. If we don't, and he's telling them, you better talk about redoing our educational system, particularly in high school. If we don't, we are position the United States to gradually become a less developed nation. He says you have to reshape the curriculum and make high schools more rigorous. That's where it starts. It starts in our elementary 
and I was talking to my wife tonight, uh, who's also a lawyer, and uh, a strong believer in, in fundamental education. That's kind of like what I believe in, too. That's how I grew up. I went to a one-room schoolhouse in Alabama. Uh, that's how I started school. There were six classes in one room. And let me tell you, you know, we may not have had all the equipment, so to speak, but I learned how to read. I can't tell how that <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> write and add and subtract. And that was pretty important. It was important to my mom. It was important to my dad that my brother and sister and I learned to do that and learned to do it right and correctly. Education is where we must start. We have to retool our educational process. We've got to get you kids, when you get out of here, to go back and get other kids, your friends, your family, your neighbors, to get out and get that education. See, a kid wants to drop out, you've got to spend an extra five minutes with them. Because I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to close with this comment right now, because I think this is really what it's all about. There's this quiz I got from my brother-in-law, and he says, he's, I came out on February 24th, and he says, give this some thought. <clears throat> Charles Schultz philosophy, you don't actually have to take the quiz, just read it, they say. Name the five wealthiest people in the world, the, five Heisman, the last five Heisman Trophy winners, the last five winners of Miss America contest, name ten people who've won the Nobel a Pulitzer Prize, name at least half a dozen Academy Award winners for the best actors and actresses, and name the last decade's worth of World Series winners. Take that test. Well, it's a very difficult test because you can't answer it. The point is, none of us remember the headliners of yesterday. The second, these are the second-rate achievers. They're the best in their fields. But the applause dies, awards tarnish, achievements are forgotten. Accolades and certificates are buried with their owners. Here's another quiz that you all ought to take. List a few teachers who aided your journey through school. Name three friends who have helped you through a difficult time. Name five people who have taught you something worthwhile. Think of a few people who have made you feel appreciated and special. Think of five people you enjoy spending time with. Name half a dozen heroes whose stories have inspired you. It's easier. The lesson? The people who make a difference in your life are not the ones with the most credentials, the most money, or the most awards. They are the ones that care. And what you need to do, and all of you need to do, is care about and make a difference with people you know. And that's enough to change the world, I believe. Thanks. <laughs>